team. So my group is currently uh, composed of two postdocs, four PhD students, um, two staff members that take care of the equipment and the administrative things. And we have um, two student assistants working with us at the moment. And then in view of time, I don't want to give a very long introduction, but I think if I show these pictures next to each other, comparing fossil fuels and renewable energy, then I hope that you will all agree with me that we need renewable energy um, for the future, um, for a bright and clean future. And as we all um, know, fossil fuels, um, we don't have um, yeah, reserves for many years to come. And then if we look at the energy potential of the different renewable energies that there exist, then we can see that the energy potential of um, the solar energy reaching us every day um, has the highest potential. Um, and if I then take this um, yellow circle and put it on Germany with uh, Halle Saale, where I'm currently working in the middle, then we can see that if we could um, harvest the solar energy with 100% efficiency, then we would only need about half the surface area of Germany in order to provide the whole world with energy. But of course, it's not very useful to have um, all the energy harvesting located um, just in Germany, but just to give you an idea about how much energy the sun is giving us every day. So how can we use solar energy? Um, over millions of years, plants have created quite a good system called uh, photosynthesis, where they convert CO2 and um, water into um, different sugars and oxygen and so on so that they can grow. As humans um, have uh, created solar cells, which are very well known um, in the meantime, but the main disadvantage of solar cells is that they only um, generate electricity when the sun is shining. So on a cloudy day and at night when we also need electricity, we would not have any energy from the sunlight. So we need to somehow store the energy from the sun. Of course, we could use a battery, but a better system would be to use ele electricity to turn um, water, split water into hydrogen and oxygen gas. And then when we need the energy, the reaction could be reversed um, in a fuel cell and give us the electricity that we need. But in this case, we have two separate systems. So we have the solar cells and the electrolysis system, which gives us two times uh, efficiency um, that is reduced. So the best would be that we combine the these two systems into one system. So basically we put a solar cell into the water and then uh, using semiconductor materials, we split um, water into hydrogen and oxygen. Um, this process is called artificial photosynthesis or also often called photoelectrochemical uh, water splitting. And then in my group, we are especially interested in using quasi one dimensional nanostructures for this. For instance, uh, nanowires uh, standing on a substrate as shown over here. First reason for this is that using nanostructures, of course, we have a very high uh, surface to volume ratio for our reaction to take place. Um, but what I find even more important is that we can, um, using such nanostructures, you, uh, we can decouple the photon absorption depth um, of the semiconductor. And for uh, cuprous oxide, I put here um, the number, which is approximately 10 micrometer. And we can decouple this from the minority charge carrier diffusion length, which for cuprous oxide is only 20 to 100 nanometers. So what does this mean? If we would um, use a film of cuprous oxide, then we would need a film with a thickness of 10 micrometer in order to capture all the sunlight. But only in the top 1% of this film, we can really split the electrons and holes that are generated and use them for the water splitting. So this gives us not a very efficient system, but if we have um, nanowires as shown over here in this image, then we can capture all the sunlight over the length of the nanowires 
and over the diameter of the nanowires, the electrons or holes can go to the surface, where in the case of a p-type material, we would um, turn H plus ions into hydrogen. And then um, the holes go to the counter electrode where oxygen is generated. And then finally, we might also have some photon scattering in between the nanowires, which would help us to capture even more sunlight. Um, so what is, uh, was already mentioned in the introduction, my group is uh, focused on many different materials or different material types, as you can see here. Um, so we work or have some projects on metal organic frameworks, on metal oxides and on standard uh, photovoltaic materials. And within the projects on metal organic frameworks, um, we use electrochemical conversion to uh, make these uh, MOFs. And we can do either a complete conversion to make nanowires consisting completely of a MOF. We can make core shell nanowire systems with a MOF shell as shown over here. And we also have a project on making new MOFs that uh, should be good for photochemical hydrogen evolution. And in this talk, I will introduce our efforts um, on these two uh, material systems. And so then for the metal oxides, we have several different methods to make metal oxide nanostructures. Um, one shown over here, an example uh, where we use templated electro deposition um, to make different metal oxide materials inside uh, templates. We can use electro spinning to make several different metal oxides. And soon we will start a new project on using um, surfactant templates with a technique called the surfactant driven self assembled soft template method in order to also make nanostructures in a different way. But today I will not talk about these um, three projects, but if you want to um, learn more about these, you can either send me an email or have a look at our website. And then within the uh, PV materials, there are two different kinds of materials we are investigating. Um, today I will also talk about our copper gallium selenide um, films and how they work for the water splitting. And next to that we also have a project on using silicon for water splitting. And then especially with coating the silicon with um, atomic layer deposition in order to um, make it much more efficient. But today I will also not talk about this project. And then we also have some um, other uh, research directions um, that do not fit in these material classes or um, can be used for, to study all of them. Um, first of all, we are interested in mechanisms and we use a technique called femtosecond um, transient absorption spectroscopy to study this. We have also made some bifunctional electrocatalysts, as can be seen over here. And was, uh, as mentioned in the introduction, I'm also um, a partner in the Fraunhofer project called Neopec, where these Fraunhofer institutes in Germany um, are interested into upscaling the photoelectrochemical water splitting and work to really towards applications. Okay, but as I already mentioned, um, the first part of this talk, I will talk about the metal organic frameworks and especially how we can make nanostructures from them. So we started this project um, with making um, nanostructured MOFs, also called nanomoths, via templated electrochemistry. So what I did here, um, I started this project when I was still at the GSI Helmholtz Center in Darmstadt. Um, I started with a template, I put an electrical layer on one side of the template, and then I filled this template with copper nanowires first using electro deposition. And then in the next step, I oxidized these copper nanowires back to copper ions. And then these uh, copper ions, when um, they were formed, and I did that in an electrolyte containing the um, organic linker molecule that I wanted to use to make the MOF, then I could make these copper BTC nanowires. So the complete nanowires here consisted of the specific MOF. 
And as you can see over here, by choosing our template, we could make um, different diameters of the nanowires and XRD characterization showed us that we indeed um, obtained these nanowires as a MOF. And then by using some special templates, we were also able to make um, nanowire networks completely consisting of a MOF as shown over here. And we were also able to make nanocones uh, consisting of a MOF as shown over here. So then when I moved to Halle in 2016, um, this uh, postdoc, Francesco Cadeo, started in my group and he said, what if we not do the electrochemical conversion inside the template, as I did before, but we first dissolve the template, so we have freestanding copper or cuprous oxide nanowires, as shown over here, and then we use um, this sample for the um, anodization to do the MOF conversion. Um, then we can make core shell nanowires. So he had to optimize the um, MOF conversion conditions a lot in order to really make this core shell structure. And one of the optimization steps was adding a capping agent um, into the MOF conversion reaction. So if we don't add a capping agent, then you can see over here that we formed really large um, MOF crystals. So this is the MOF and these are the Cooper's Oxide nanowires, which was not what we wanted. So then we started by adding a little bit of uh, the capping agent. And then we saw that we formed um, a bit bigger MOF crystals, but they were all around the MOF nanowires. And then from the XRD, you can see here that we indeed um, formed the MOF. So this was the XRD from our sample, and this was the calculated XRD pattern for the copper BTC MOF. And then when we added more of the capping agents, so in this case, five milligrams per milliliter, then you can see here in this image that we formed much smaller um, MOF crystals around the nanowires. And also because we have now less MOF material, we see in the XRD um, that the signal became less. Um, so in this case, we used the capping agent, but then we were thinking, okay, if we put a polymer um, on top of the um, MOF uh, nanoparticles, then we might block the pores of the MOF. So then we also started to use a, a modulator, which is known in the MOF field, to be able to control the nucleation and the growth of the MOF. Um, and in this case, as you can see from these SEM images, we formed um, also small MOF nanoparticles um, very nicely located around these Cooper's Oxide nanowires. Um, and then we also went to the TEM to have a look at these uh, core shell nanowires with the MOF particles around. So these are the TEM images um, of just the cuprous oxide nanowires. So we see that we had quite uh, smooth uh, cuprous oxide nanowires. And then when we add the MOF shell around, then we can see uh, very nicely that we have these uh, MOF nanocrystals nicely uh, located around these cuprous oxide nanowires. And um, we also did um, an EDX line scan over the MOF nanoparticle and here the cuprous oxide nanowires. And then we can see that at the MOF part, we have much more uh, carbon and also uh, copper inside um, these MOF nanocrystals. And then in the cuprous oxide nanowires, the signal for the carbon goes down to zero and we have uh, mainly copper um, and some oxygen inside these nanowires. And then finally, within this project, we did uh, PEC measurements. Um, so what we did here, we first um, added some extra thicker layer of cuprous oxide in between the nanowires in order to reduce the dark current during the PEC measurement. And then over here, you can see um, the PEC measurements where these parts are where the light was turned on and these parts which 
much lower currents was where we turned off the light. And then the blue curve is for just the Cooper's oxide nanowires. And the red curve is for the Cooper's oxide nanowires plus the MOF, as can be seen in the image over here. And then we see that um, the onset potential remained more or less the same for um, both samples. But when we are at um, these still positive potentials versus the reversible hydrogen electrode, that the photocurrent for the nanowires with the MOF was um, significantly higher than the photocurrent obtained for the nanowires without the MOF. And if we take um, this potential, 0 0.3 volt versus RHE, then um, we can see the photocurrents that we obtained over here. And this corresponds to an increase of 68% when we added the MOF to these Cooper's oxide nanowires. Okay, so then I would like to continue now with the second project that I um, wanted to show here today, um, in which we used uh, copper gallium selenide films for the photoelectrochemical water splitting. So uh, copper gallium selenide um, belongs to the um, chalk copyright um, family, also very well known as uh, TSIX materials, CIGS. Um, and the nice thing about these chalk copyrights is, as you can see over here, is that by tuning the composition or the combination of the different materials, so copper, gallium, uh, indium, sulfur, and selenium, we can tune the band gap of the material. And then um, we were especially interested in uh, the combination copper, gallium, and selenium. So, which is shown over here on the right side of the spectrum with a band cap of approximately 1.7 EV. And this material also seems um, sta more stable in water than the other ones. Um, so, to make our films, we use a method called co-evaporation, which belongs to the uh, physical vapor deposition method, in which we have elemental sources of the different materials, so copper and gallium and selenium. And then by adjusting the temperature of these evaporation uh, sources, we can tune how much material comes to our substrate, as shown over here. And here is one example of one of the samples that we made with the different temperatures. And then in this window, we actually did the growth. And then by tuning these temperatures, we can tune the ratio between copper and gallium, uh, for instance. So this is what we did. And then we could make um, copper, gallium, selenide films with these different copper to gallium ratios, as you can see over here. Um, and when we went down from a stoichiometric ratio of one to one approximately, to a ratio of one to three for copper to gallium, then we can see that we started with quite large crystals, but then upon decreasing the copper to gallium ratio, we, um, we decreased the size of our crystals, as can also be seen in these cross-section SEM images, where it also seems that we have some kind of pillared growth um, for the lowest uh, copper to gallium ratios. And then from the XRD patterns, we could see that when we have um, a higher copper to gallium ratio, as shown over here, that we have the copper gallium selenide phase um, with a ratio of 1 to 1 to 2 for copper to gallium to selenium. Um, and when we then decrease the amount of copper in our samples, then we were able to form the ordered vacancy uh, compounds of copper gallium selenide with a ratio of uh, one to three to five for copper gallium to selenium. So then we also did PEC measurements of these different films, um, where here we have the highest copper to gallium ratio, which corresponds to more or less copper gallium selenide two. Um, 
And we went to um, copper to gallium to selenium 135 as shown over here. And what we see is that we, when we decrease the copper to gallium ratio, that we got a better onset potential. So in this case, an onset potential. So where the light starts to have an influence on the photocurrent more to the right is better. Um, but the saturated photocurrent decreased. So here we have a saturated photocurrent of approximately 13 milliamp per square centimeter. And here the saturated photocurrent um, reached more or less 20, minus 20 milliamp per square centimeter. And then we also did for this um, 135 phase, we also did a long-term measurement and it seems from this measurement that this material is uh, quite stable over time during photoelectrochemical measurements. And these uh, spikes or this behavior is coming from hydrogen gas bubbles um, that were stuck to the surface of our material. And then for these um, to extreme compositions. Uh, we also did a full electrochemical impedance spectroscopy um, study. Um, and we were very happy that our paper got accepted this week in Electrochemica Acta. So hopefully soon it will, um, array will, will come online. So we measured at different potentials the um, electrochemical impedance uh, spectroscopy uh, spectra. And then we had to design a new um, equivalent circuit in order to model our films and in order to fit these curves. So in this new circuit, we added some capacitances for the defects, for the surface charge region, for the surface states, and for the um, Helmholtz capacitance, for the Helmholtz layer that you always have uh, when doing electrochemical measurements. And then when fitting um, this, we could plot the capacitance of the surface charge region in a so-called Malchotky plot and find the flat band potential of our um, copper gallium selenide 2 uh, films. So in this case, it was a flat band potential of 0 0.57 volts. And then we also did the same measurements for the uh, 135 phase, where we had to use a different equivalent circuit. So here we had to combine some effects um, in order to fit these curves. And then we found a flat band potential of 0 0.86 volt versus RHE. And then if we compare these two flat band potentials, we found a difference between them of 290 volt, millivolts. Um, and this difference was very well in agreement with the difference that we found in the onset potentials of um, 270 millivolts. So we could really um, show that the difference in onset potentials between these two extreme films with the extreme compositions um, matches with the flatman potential. And then finally, what we also, um, so the, the last thing I wanted to show for this project, what we also did is we put um, the two different materials on top of each other. So we started with a layer of the one to one to two uh, film, and then we added a thin layer of the one to three to five um, material on top. And this can be seen from this EDX mapping, um, we did not fully cover um, the 112 film with the 135 composition. So we had both materials still at the surface. And what we then very nicely obtained is that when we combine these materials, um, which is the curve here in red, which we call the three stage process, we can see that we have the very high saturated photocurrent from the uh, 112 phase and um, additionally the more positive onset potential of the 135 phase. So with that I am at the end of my presentation so I would like to thank all the people 
from our Tixili Nano Institute um, for very useful uh, discussions. Also, would like to um, thank our collaborators and, of course, the funding agencies, the BMBF and the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. And last but not least, I should thank uh, my group who is doing all the work in the lab and comes up with a lot of good ideas. And then especially for these projects, so my former postdoc Francesco Cadeo for the MOF project, um, together with uh, his student Florian Himmelstein, and then for the copper gallium selenide um, project. Um, this is led by the, my PhD student based at Mamoudi, and he got the help from two students, one uh, Leonard Giesenberg, and also now Florian Himmelstein uh, is you, uh, helping him. And finally, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.